Well, Peter, it's time. Uh, I, I'm not going to try to tell you anything about Peter other than he is sharing the importance of taking care of something that we have for free. All righty? Peter, come on up. Give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As you heard, my name is Peter Vodinka. I'm going to be talking to you today a little bit about my story, my life. I have kind of a unique perspective on everything what we are talking today about, what we're living, what we're feeling, what we're experiencing with our government now, government tomorrow, and what we experience with the America itself. I was born behind the Iron Curtain during the Communists, during the Cold War. I live half of my life behind the Iron Curtain. And I live half of my life in the United States of America, the land of the free and opportunities. And uh, so I experienced the both sides of the, sto of the spectrum. I live under total, complete government control, and, and I live here in the United States. So it gave me a little bit different perspective for the thing which we are talking about, because I experienced them myself. I was born under government health care under national health care. My children were born under national health care. I was living in the country which we didn't vote for president. President was chosen for us. We have no, no, nothing to say. So I am, ta I am gonna be talking a little bit to you about uh, my experiences and also how we get to America. I was born in communist country. I was born in 1955. The communists came to power in 1948. It was only one political party and only a ruling party. It was totally a ruling party. And I was born in 1955, and since I was 17 years old, I was wishing and praying and dreaming and hoping to go to the United States of America. I heard that people in America have freedoms, freedom of speech, religion, political beliefs. We talk about those freedoms. Those are part of our constitution. But there is lots of other freedoms which we don't even know we have in America, or you don't, I do. Because I experienced the opposite. People in America can wear the clothes they want. People in America can travel abroad. They can get together in the assembly like this. People in America can move from place to place. You get tired of Minnesota winter? You want to move to Arizona, Florida? You go. Nobody asks you questions. You just move. Your children go to school. They want to get education. They are free to get education. They can choose what they want to do and what they want to be in the future. We don't have any of those choices. Our government decided who can get education and who cannot get education. Czechoslovakia has 15 million people population, small country. It was about the size of South Dakota. And of those 15 million people, only 1 million were members of Communist Party. And they decided everything for the rest of the country, including who can get education. My parents, for example, were not members of Communist Party. So my brother and I, we couldn't get education. We could go to school after we finished grade school and become tradesmen, carpenters, electricians, auto mechanics. But we could not go any higher than that. That was, that was reserved for children from trusted communist families. So since I'm 17 years old, I want to leave and I want to go to America. We have border, Czechoslovakia is in the middle of the Europe. We have borders with East Germany, Poland, Russia, and Hungary. Those were also the communist countries. But we also have border with West Germany and Austria. Those two countries, on the other hand, were part of the Western Europe. Those were Western European countries. And since 17 years old, I'm dreaming to come to America. But we were not allowed to, to cross our borders. We were not allowed to leave our country. We couldn't. Our government wouldn't let us. So I couldn't get on the plane and fly to America or travel in any means. So I keep my ears and eyes open. And I was trying to figure out how to get out alive. And I was collecting the pictures and ideas in my head. And I built in the picture. I was putting the puzzle together in my own mind, trying to find out how can I escape from my country. And what I learned was in order for me to come to America, I would have to go to West Germany or Austria. Because those countries, of course, were part of the Western European, Europe country. So I would have to go over there and go through a refugee camp, which I learned were there, and go through a process to come to the United States. Now, like I said, we are not allowed to cross our border, especially not in the West European countries. 
Our government knew of this option, so they closed the border between West Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia and make it impenetrable. That border was constructed out of many different levels of fences. One of the fences was electric fence, 3,000 volts electricity. So if you touch it, you die. But that wasn't enough. So they laid the mines on the ground in front of the fences in case somebody wants to sneak around in the middle of the night, you step on the mine, you blow yourself up. But that still wasn't enough. So they cleared the section of the land for miles and miles and miles all along that border. And they erected watchtowers with the soldiers, machine guns and binoculars. And they could see the land between this tower and the next tower on both sides. So every section was watched by two teams, but that still wasn't enough. So they had the foot soldiers patrolling the borders back and forth with the dogs. Because many times the dog can smell more than people can see. But that still wasn't enough. So eventually they erected what we come to know as Iron Curtain. We call it border zone. This was the example of the border zone between West Germany and East Germany. This dark line down at the bottom is the border itself. You can see on the West German side there is nothing. People can come right up to it and touch it. On the East German side, on the other hand, there is three miles wide section of the land. This is full of the mines and soldiers and trap, booby traps and everything you can imagine, fences, ditches. And it was clearly posted. There were big signs in the cover that do not enter. This is a border zone. You will be shot. So you could be shot or arrested in, uh, inside your own land. Three miles before that border itself. And that wasn't to keep other people to coming in. It was to keep us from leaving. They would rather kill us than let us be free. So it took me 10 years to collect the information, to find out how to get out. And after 10 years, I thought I know how to get out. Only difference was by then I was married. I have 24 year old wife, four year old daughter and two year old son. So now I have to bring my whole family across. It's not myself anymore. And what I find out was that communist country of Yugoslavia, which was also a communist country, but their president, World War II General Marshal Tito, many of you probably heard this name, who became president of Yugoslavia after war, never succumbed to Russians as much as the rest of the Eastern Europe. He kept a little bit more freedom for his people than the rest of us did. Not much, but a little bit more freedoms. And what I learned was that the border between Yugoslavia and Austria to the north and Yugoslavia and the Italy to the west was not as tight as our borders. Yes, there were fences there, but there are supposed to be sections of the land which didn't even have fences in the rugged areas along the rivers and mountains and swamps. So my idea was that we're going to try to go to Yugoslavia as if we're going for vacation. And if we do get permission to go there, we're going to sneak across the border from Aust Yugoslavia to Austria, probably in the middle of the night. Now, when we're going to go to Yugoslavia, because it was still a communist country, we have to apply with our government, not with Yugoslavian government, with our government to, to let us leave our borders. Now, our application, which was the summer of 1983, when we apply, have to be approved by our government first. And when I speak about government, I mean secret police. Our government have three major bodies of control to keep us citizens in control under check. That was regular police, military, and the secret police. The military and secret, uh, regular police, they wore uniforms. We know who these people are. We could recognize them on the street. Secret police didn't. That was the baddest and scariest body of control. That was something equivalent to, I would call, maybe Homeland Security, security in today's days in America. Or at least that's where the Homeland Security, I think, is actually going to. They were undercover. They didn't wear uniforms. We always knew somebody's listening, somebody's watching, watching our every steps. They were bad people. We didn't know who they are. Those were the people who were arresting us. Those were the people who were torturing us in the prisons. Those, they always have the spies, also have the spies around the world. And they were the people who were scared of most. And they have the informants throughout the population. Local people like you and I, which were secretly working on the side for extra money for secret police, just listening to their neighbors and people who talk to. Just to give you an idea, the group of people which we have over here, in this group, there is good chance under communism, there will be probably about three or four of us who would be members of the informants for secret police. And nobody would know who they are. And they wouldn't even know each other. That would be your friend. 
That would be your neighbor sitting next to you. That could be even your husband and wife without you knowing it, or your brother. And what they did, they listened throughout the population. And when they decided that somebody is talking too much, maybe too far to the right, like we did today, not even close to that, of course, but even a little bit there, then they have to be seen, they have to be watched more, and then you become on the watch, close watch list without knowing anything about that. So the secret police was the first body of control which have to approve my application to go to Yugoslavia camping because that's what we said we wanna go for the vacation. And they did approve it. But after they approve it, it also have to be approved by my employer, city police, city government, county government, and the military. All these institutions have to approve that they don't see any problem with me, I mean, my family of four, to go to Yugoslavia camping. We got approved to go. So now we are preparing for our departure. My wife and I are only two people who know what we're planning to do. We're not going over there camping. We're going over there with hope that we're gonna escape. We're gonna go to America. We're gonna have your life. That's what we want. We wanna have what you have. The life which you have, the freedoms which you still have. That's why we're going over there. <coughs> we have to keep everything look like we're going camping and nothing else. Because like I said, everybody was watching, everybody. And three days before our departure, we went to visit our parents and brothers and sisters and we says goodbye to them. He says, we're going camping, we're gonna be gone for two weeks, we'll see you later. Those were very emotional goodbyes for us. Because we know if we do defect, we might never be able to see them again. And we couldn't let them to, to know anything, to suspect anything. We have to control everything, our emotions, so they don't suspect anything. As a matter of fact, we didn't even tell our relatives we're going to Yugoslavia. We told them we're going to Hungary camping at the Lake Balatan. And the reason why we give them misinformation was that we knew if we do defect, they will be interrogated by secret police. And if secret police find out they knew of our plans or have any suspicion, they could go to prison for enabling the crime because by our action, we became the political criminals. So we told our relatives something else, hoping that way under interrogations, they will not need to lie because they didn't know. They will say, hey, we didn't know what they were doing. And that was true. Because if they knew, they would have to lie. And of course, it's easy to slip and tell on yourself under pressure. About three days later, we get into our small Eastern European car and we drive it towards the border. And we are very scared. We could be arrested any time. We have to go through our own border guards. And they were also members of secret police, the people who check your passport. They could turn us around. They could stop us. They could say, hey, we changed our mind. They could send us to prison. They didn't have to have reasons. Believe it or not, we didn't have the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, as I was talking about. As, as, as a matter of fact, everything, every right which the United States Constitution gave us as a citizens was pretty much illegal in Czechoslovakia. We could go to prison for what we say, for what we do. Believe it or not, our government end up having the law that you can be persecuted for your thoughts. So if they decided, hey, we know you are thinking about escaping, thinking about overthrowing the government, anything. You end up in the prison. And people did. I personally know family this happened to. That family must have been on the secret police watch list or something. They decided they need to be scared or thought lesson. Who knows what was their thinking? The young man in the family went for the Sunday walk along the Vltava River in Prague with the three months old baby in the stroller. He was picked up along the road. His wife got a phone call to come to a certain police station to pick her child. When she arrived over there, they, they handing her a baby. She says, why are you giving me my baby? Where is my husband? They says, take your baby and go home. She says, no, tell me what's, what's wrong. Did my husband, was there an accident? Did my fa husband fall in the river, drowned? Got run over a car, what's going on? They says, leave. Then she starts seeing that something suspicious. He says, I'm not gonna leave unless you tell me what's going on. He says, you better leave or we're gonna arrest you and they raise your baby in government institutions. So she left. They were sending letters. They were making phone calls. 
They were trying to find out what happened to her husband. They never find out. They didn't know if he's alive. They didn't know if he's dead. They didn't know if he's ever coming back. They didn't know what he is, where he is. He might be in Moscow, in the gulags, who knows? Two and a half years later, he came back. He was in the prison that whole time. There was no jury. There was no accusation. There was no court. They just locked him up. And when he said, hey, why am I here? I didn't do anything. They says, if you did something, you would be shot by now. Pretty much telling him, you'd be happy that you are still alive and be shut up and get in the line. So this is what we were raised them and doing. And now we are trying to do something really highly illegal. So we were very scared. But luckily for us, kids fell in sleep before we arrived at the border. They were little. And when we stopped at the border, they woke up and they start crying, which was a good thing this time because the border guard did not deal with the screaming kids on the back seat, you know, so he stamped our passports and sent us through. So anyway, so we crossed into the Hungary and, uh, and that was the first most important step, step to leave our country. I'm going to fast forward just because of the time limit. I'm going to fast forward about four days. Four days later, after many struggles and, and scary and close encounters and scary times, we were driving towards the border of the Yugoslavia to Austria. And my idea was, because we tried a few things before how to cross that border and they didn't work out. So we come with new idea. We knew there was about five roads leading from Yugoslavia to Austria, five border crossings. They were one directional. Austrians could travel back and forth as they pleased. Their government didn't stop them. Yugoslavians, on the other hand, were not allowed to go to Austria. Their government wouldn't let them. And I knew from collecting the information that the border crossing farthest one to the east, where the road crosses the border and the Hungarian border was about one mile wide section of the land. And that did not supposed to have any fences. So I'm thinking we're gonna time it so we arrive at this place at two o'clock in the morning. We're gonna leave the car. And on the foot, we will try to sneak across the border, enter Austria, circle back to the same road, and continue on that road on the foot until we get picked up by Austrian police and taken to refugee camp or until we find the refugee camp somehow. So now this is day four of our vacation and we're driving towards the border. And it's four o'clock afternoon and we are already only 40 miles away. And I don't want to come out any closer in the daylight. I'm afraid of regular Yugoslavian police patrolling the roads. And if they see East European car with East European license plate, they're going to turn around. They're going to arrest us, start, start asking questions. Because again, this is hard to understand in America. We can go anywhere we want. But we were approved to be over here. We were approved to be in the town of Rijeka on the Adriatic Sea. Just being in neighborhood or anywhere else, we would become suspicious. We're not allowed. So as we're driving on the road, I'm looking for a place to hide. And suddenly there is grassy meadow on the right side and there is patch of the woods in the distance. And we drove across the grass and we drove into the woods. And it turned out to be perfect hiding place. There was grassy opening all in, in the middle, tall trees around us with the thick underbrush. So when we were in this place, we were not seen. This is the place we're gonna wait until one o'clock in the morning to leave. So we arrive at the board border by two. But of course, we were very scared. We are in a foreign country. First, we have guilty feeling because we're planning to do something highly illegal. Second, we speak in different language than anybody else. That catches people's attention. So we are trying to keep the kids quiet. You know, they were in the car for four days. They want to run out and scream and play. They have lots of energy. And again, we were afraid somebody's going to hear the kids screaming in the woods and come over and investigate what's going on and find us. So the day was coming on, my wife makes some dinner and it was time to put kids to the bed. And I'm thinking about every possible scenario, about everything which can happen that night. I'm thinking, you know what? We wanna wake those kids up at two o'clock in the morning and drag them out from the war car and they will probably start crying. But we cannot have it this time. They are gonna be Yugoslavian soldiers. They cannot hear us. But how do you explain what you're planning to do to four and two year old children? So I sit down, I says, listen, I need you to talk to you. I need you to listen to me. We're gonna put you to bed on the back seat of the car just like we did the night before. And while you are sleeping, your mom and I are gonna be driving the car. And in the middle of the night, we will wake you up. We will leave the car and walk away on the foot. You will be very tired. You will be very sleepy and you will want to cry. 
but we're going to try this time because there might be some bad people if they hear us we can get in the trouble again i don't want to scare them too much with the bad people because i'm thinking i scare them too much with the bad people now and that is what's gonna make them cry when they wake up in the middle of the night and there is nothing but the darkness around with the bad people in it so we put them to bed fully dressed with that just took their shoes off and now my wife and i are preparing what we're gonna do next what we're gonna take with until this moment we were hoping we're gonna make it across that car with our car across the border and therefore we can have transportation to and wheels and the camping and the clothes and the food to get to refugee camp we decided we're not going to even try now and we also know they have only one free hand to carry stuff because i will be holding my boy in my arms and my wife will be holding our daughter's hand so we have to decide what we take with because we have only one free hand what's the most important to take when you left everything but you own behind and now you, you want to walk away from the rest of your stuff we decided that we need the spare clothes for the children they are little they can get dirty and tore easy so we took one of the bags which we have the good sh shoulder strap and we stuff it with the kids clothes i was gonna carry that that was the heaviest and most important luggage you can see it's not that big compared to size of my hand then we decided to take one of our sleeping bags it has its own case with the handle so it was easy to carry my wife was gonna carry that and the reason why we decided for sleeping bag again we didn't know what's gonna happen even if we make it across the border it might take days or maybe even weeks before we find to refuge the refugee camp somewhere maybe we will travel at night and hide during the day we need something warm for children we felt and then we took another bag with the camera personal documents and small stuff and my wife are thinking you know we need to spare clothes for ourselves also we're going in the foreign country we don't even speak the language and we have only one clothes but we have no more free hands so we thought about that hard and we came this idea that we're gonna put on everything double to carry to carry this uh, spare clothes on our bodies without occupying our hands double socks underwear pants and shirts and now we have it all ready and we are sitting in that car and we are waiting for one o'clock in the morning and we are waiting and we are waiting and it was the longest night you can imagine we have this horrible night in front of us anything can happen and the waiting is what kills you because if you're doing nothing you're putting too much too many bad thoughts in your own head you start to scare yourself I want to get going I'm looking at my watch probably every 15 seconds because anytime I look at it it seems to be same place it was before and as we sitting over there again I'm thinking about every possible scenario which might happen and there is something I need to talk to my wife about this subject was in my head for about three months at this moment but I never found the right time right moment right words to tell her what I need to tell her but I'm running out of time. I need to tell her now before we arrive at the border. And I says, listen, I know you are scared and I don't wanna scare you anymore. But there is one thing we need to be prepared for. One of us might get shot tonight or break leg or simply trip and fall down. If that happened, that other one is to keep on going because if we get caught all together that's it that's everything that's the end of everything we heard that our government have automatic 10-year prison sentence for both parents in the uranium mines that's where the political criminals were mining uranium with the bare hands and they would take our children away because by our action of trying to leave our country and have the better future for us and our children in our government we prove to them in their eyes that we are not fit parents to raise the children because obviously we are not raising them in proper socialistic ideology. So they would raise them in government institutions, brainwash them since our kids. But if at least one of us make it across the border, there's a chance we can get the rest of the family there, maybe through International Red Cross, maybe through Austrian government, some other organization. There is still a chance. So I told my wife, if I go down, I don't want you to stop. I don't want you to check on me. I don't want you to try to help me out the ground. You have to keep on going. If I go down, it is that much more important that you make it across the border. And if you happen to go down, 
I need you to understand that's what I am doing. I'm not leaving you behind because I don't love you. I'm not leaving you behind because I don't want you. But that's our only chance. Of course, now she had even more bad thoughts in her head than she did before, so now she's even scared more. And as we waiting for that time, you know, it stopped raining. It was raining for two days. In the middle of the night, the rain stopped, but mist started raising up. It was getting foggier and foggier. I'm thinking, you know, in that fog, it's going to take longer to drive to that border. Plus, I don't want to get lost and arrive too late when it's already daylight. Or maybe arrive at the wrong place. So it was 12.30. I said, let's do it now. I started the car. We drove out of the woods, across the grass. And now we're traveling north. And the tension in the car eased up a lot because now we are busy doing something. I'm driving the car. My wife had map on her life. It's the flashlight. She's checking every intersection, every exit, every town and village we're driving through, making sure we are driving in the right road, in the right direction. At as we're driving, suddenly it started raining again. It knocked the fog down, but visibly it improved. We could drive faster. But the rain is picking car more and more. And we're driving for some time, and the road turns sharp right, and now we're driving parallel. We're, counter, we're driving east instead of north. But we saw that turn on the map, so we know we are still on the right road. But we also know we have to exit to the left again. And again, after some time, there is sign pointing to the left saying Austria. So we turn. And now we are coming closer to the border. And we are judging the distance from that border, from our map, trying to guess how close we are. And we think we have about eight miles to go yet. And the road is sharp left, half circle around some obstacles in front of us. And when we came on the other side, there it was. There was border. There is gate across the road. There is soldier with AK-47 on his chest. And there is street light lighting this place up. And we were not prepared for it. I wasn't planning to come close enough for them to actually see us and know we are there. And now I start the car and we are sitting in this guy's full view. And I don't know what to do, so I put the car in the reverse and I back up around those turns and disappeared out of his sight. And I told my wife, stay over here, I'm gonna go back there on the foot and I'm gonna see what I can see. So she locks the door behind me. And I'm coming back, I'm walking back there at night. And the rain is just pouring down now. And I heard my own footsteps on the blacktop. I didn't want him to hear me coming. So I jump in the ditch, I'm sneaking through grass and, and bushes and trying to get as close as I dare. I know this guy is standing in the circle of the light because there is street light lighting it up. As far as I stay out of that circle, he cannot see me. So I got as close as I dare, I squat down. I'm looking at the situation in front of me. My heart is just racing to my chest. This guy is not too far away from me. I can clearly see him, he's right there. And I know he has orders to stop people like us for any cause. And as I'm squatting and looking at it, trying to figure out what to do, what I see is, I see the road behind that soldier, behind the gate, enters the forest. And through the forest at the distance, I can see another street light. I assume that's Austrian guardhouse. And on the right side was small building with the lights in the windows. But I heard voices talking, so I know there is minimum two more soldiers inside that building. And on the right side was, and, and there was small car with the border guards marking on the door. And on the right side was dirt road, full of the puddle and mud, disappearing into the fields and out of the circle of the light. And again, I'm sitting over and my heart is just racing and my mind is just working a weird way. It's almost like suddenly my heart and my brain separated from each other, my body and brain separated. Everything changed, everything is just different. At that moment I realized this is it. Most of my adult life, for 10 years, I was praying and wishing and dreaming and hoping that one day, one day I'm gonna be somewhere at the border. I'm gonna be looking across this border. I'm gonna be ready to cross it into the freedom. I didn't know where that place is going to be. I have no clue how that place is going to look like. I didn't even know if I will ever find that place. But at this moment I realize this is the place. It's going to happen tonight or it will never happen. And I'm looking at the soldiers and I don't know how to get around him. I am looking at it. I'm thinking I cannot make the run at this guy with my children. But I know I have to get them across that light somehow in the darkness, safe and alive. 
And I didn't know what to do. So I was praying to God. I was asking God to tell me what to do next. To help me make my mind. To give me, to show me the way. And protect us. Please protect my family and my children. And I start forcing myself to think again. I am physically forcing my brain to snap out of this weird stage I was in. And think. And then I realize. That this in next hour. Inside of next one hour. One of the three scenarios is going to happen. Either we're going to be bleeding on the ground from the gunshots. Or we're going to be in the handcuffs. And starting the dreadful way back home and future in the shackles. Or we will be free. I didn't know which one of those scenarios is going to happen. But every one of them is going to change our life forever. Nothing will ever be the same in our charge life ever again. I keep saying that we live two lives. And that was the moment where our first life ended. And new life was about to begin. At least any one of those three scenarios. That new life is going to take us totally different direction from that one moment on. Nothing will ever be the same in our life. There was one thing I could have done yet. I could have walked away. I could have given up. I could go back to my car and tell my wife, hey, it's too dangerous. I don't know how to get around that guy. We, would, we could drive back to the sea, spend two weeks vacation as if nothing happened and then come back home two weeks later. That never crossed my mind. Which turned out to be a good thing because unknown to us at this moment, secret police back home already found out of our plans and they were already hunting for us. Had I made the decision, two weeks later we would arrive at our border and we would be arrested and our kids would be ripped away from us forever. We might never see them or each other ever again. But that never crossed my mind. I went back to my car, I said, this is it, let's do it now. We will hold the children up. We put the shoes on them. They were dizzy and confused, but they were not crying. I start the car, drove back on the road, turned north, and now we are coming back towards the border. Only this time we know what's waiting around the corner. And when we came around the turn, now we are driving directly towards the guy with the rifle. And my heart is just racing in my chest. I'm expecting him to swing the rifle down and start shooting at us any moment. Again, you gotta understand, we were raised in the police country. We were not afraid of criminals, as crazy as it sounds. We were scared of police. Just the sight of the man in uniform or police car on the street, raise your heartbeat and tie your stomach in the nuts. And now we're driving directly to a guy who I know has orders to shoot us if he has to. And I'm telling myself to stay calm I'm telling myself, he's looking directly into my headlights right now. He cannot see the model or the license plate of the car yet. And we are coming closer and closer. In the last minute, I turned the dirt road. And now we are slipping and sliding and driving on the, in the fields. And the answer which I got was to drive on it. Our cover's already blown. They already know we are here. We're just going to drive on the dirt road, stop the car, hustle to the left. And hopefully, with God's help, we're going to cross that border before they realize what's going on. But luckily for us, which I didn't know at the time, on the left side where I want to go, is something growing in the fields and it's about waist deep. And the rain is just coming down in the sheets. It's like torrential rain. I'm thinking this is going to be really hard to wade through it with getting little children especially. Plus it's going to be really muddy. It's raining for two days. So I'm hoping that something's going to change. And I'm driving farther and farther. And then it did. It changed. That field stopped. New field started. Something was just sprouting out the ground. And between those two fields was grassy strip about eight, ten feet wide, separating those two fields. I'm thinking this is solid enough for us to walk on it. I start the car. I turn the lights off. Shut the engine. Left the keys and ignition. We open the door. We jump, jump out the car. We open the back door. We scoop the kids and bags, which we have prepared over there. And we start walking on this grassy strip, which we cannot see. We're just feeling it with our feet because it's just dark, darkest night you, can, night you can imagine. And through all my planning and preparation and thinking about every detail and every scenario which can happen that night, there was one thing I never thought about. The dome light in your car. When you open the door, the light goes on. 
and they were watching. They see the car driving in the fields at was two o'clock in the morning. And when we open the door, they must see us taking kids and bags and they figure out we're gonna make the run for the border. We make about 10 steps away from that car and that lit up car I was behind us in the distance just erupted with the activities. Voices start screaming commands, dogs start barking, the car in general, the car is slipping and sliding, coming in our direction. We can see somebody carrying that spotlight, heavy duty spotlight, leaving those buildings and moving across. I'm assuming this guy is running along the border, he's trying to cut us off. So I look behind me, I says, run, run as fast as you can. And we took off running. And with every step, with every breath, with every cell in my body, I am praying and wishing and hoping for the woods. Because when I was looking at the gate earlier, I saw the forest behind the gate. I'm thinking if we make it to the forest, we're gonna be across the border. And in the meantime, the car stopped behind us. And there is two more spotlights, reflectors on our trail. And they are closing in. They could run a lot faster than they didn't carry little children. And they know exactly where we are because of location of our car and the grassy strip. But luckily for us at this moment, they couldn't see us because the rain was coming down so hard that those lights were not penetrating the night. The rain was not stopping the lights to reach our bodies. They couldn't see us. At this moment, we have only one chance to make it across the border before they come close enough to shoot us or see us. And we didn't know how far that border is, we just knew the general direction. And as we are running, suddenly there is no ground under my feet and I am falling head first and we landed in the water pretty much on our heads. I stood up, luckily the water was only knee deep. I picked my son up because the fall knocked, knocked him by my grasp. He still wasn't crying. The bag fell out my shoulder but it was like right next to my foot so I grabbed it. We wade through the water and there is hill on the other side. I cannot see it but I know I am going up slippery and soggy and wet hill. In the meantime, I'm listening for sounds of my wife and my daughter behind me. And I'm hoarsely whispering to dark and somewhere there, there is water over here, but don't worry about that. Get in the water, they are coming. And we get to the top of the hill, and a little bit farther, and there is the forest, and we bought it in the woods. But we don't know if this is for sure Astria, we don't know if that's, we are across the border, so we are not slowing down, we keep running. And this darkness night you can imagine, so anytime something's holding me back, I'm breaking through it with my chest, through the branches and brush. And then one, son, one time my son started crying in my hand. And I says, remember we talked about this yesterday. You cannot cry, so cry right now. This is what I was telling you. And he stopped immediately. It wasn't until next morning when the daylight came. We saw that he had pretty good scratch on his face. This was after it was all washed and clean. But when we say the first time, that scratch went across his nose, through his cheek, and into his ear. And it actually dry enough blood, he had dry blood all the way down to the collar of his shirt. First time, when we saw it, first time, we thought that he, they shot at us and he got grazed by the bullet, actually. That was probably when he started crying. He got hit and cut by some branch in the face. And he stopped and I told him, we talk about this two-year-old kid just a little bit older than baby. I couldn't imagine what could be going through those little children's heads. Being woke up at two o'clock in the morning, dragged out from the warm bed in the downpour, being chased through the night, fall in the water on his head, and then get hit and cut in the face. And stop, and I told him, we talk about this. You cannot cry. At that moment, still on the Rhine, I look behind me because we are in the woods and I'm assuming that they're gonna stop. And I'm looking directly into the lights now. And I can see streams of the water just coming down, just shining and sparkling. And I, I can see the thick foliage, leaves and brush. And it looked to me like tar in the woods. And my heart just dropped. And again, our horse lives whispered to my wife. And I says, they didn't stop. They are still following us. Throw everything away so we can move faster. And I dropped the bag from my hand. And we kept pushing on. And after some time, we realized there was nobody there. We lost them, just night. So we slow down, we huddle, catch our breath. Then we veer to the left because I wanna find that same road. I don't wanna get lost somewhere in the woods and circle back to the border or something. And after some time, it was probably two o'clock in the morning. 
Uh, four o'clock in the morning by now. And after some time, we come to the edge of the forest. And again, there is grass. And on the backside of that meadow, there is road. The same road which we left before. <coughs> but I didn't want to leave the protection of the woods yet. I didn't know what to do, yet, to do yet. Our brains and our hearts didn't catch up with each other yet. We are thinking that we made it, but we don't know for sure. I'm looking at behind us because in the short distance, there is guard house. I'm thinking, did we make the short circle and we are right behind the Yugoslavian guard house? Or did we make big circle and we are right behind the Austrian guard house? And I'm looking at the flag which was displaced over there. And I start kicking myself in the butt because I didn't educate myself enough and I didn't know how either one of those countries' flag looked like. I asked my wife if she knew and she didn't know either, so we still don't know. This was, it was June 21st. Time of the year when you have the shortest night and longest dates. And when we cross that border, which at this time we are still not 100% sure, that train stopped. It didn't fade away or slow down. It stopped. It was almost as if God turned it off because its protection was no more necessary. And immediately there were stars in the clouds everywhere. One of those starry, starry nights, the stars are just shining and sparkling like diamonds. We haven't seen sun for two days. And the minute we cross that border, there is nothing but the stars. But I am thinking, what we not, what we gonna do next? I am thinking, you know, it's gonna start getting light pretty soon. We need to get out of here. We need to get away from this border as fast as we can. I says, let's go. We have to get out of here. Let's go. So we start walking. We cross the road, grass, got on the road, and now we are walking away. And the sun is not coming up yet, but it's getting a little bit lighter. And we can see around us. There was no town or anything. We were somewhere in the outside, in the countryside. On the right side, there were a few farm buildings, typical German, you know, structures. This is the wooden decorations carved underneath the roofs and around the windows and doors. And flowers everywhere. There are flowers outside the windows, flowers on the fences, flowers in the gardens. And we see, suddenly we noticing the colors. Everything was colorful and beautiful. And it was one of those just God's given beautiful early summer quiet and peaceful crisp just gorgeous golly early summer morning and we couldn't believe how colorful everything was and for first time in our life we realized that we were living living our whole lives in the colorless country everything was gray over there or something there were no colors you somebody told me that was you went to east germany right you that was you just crossing the border in Berlin, one town, you crossing from the west part to, to, to east part, you notice the difference in the colors and everything. Yeah. It was gloomy and gray. And we see the colors and suddenly, finally, it dawned on us that we made it. That dream which I had most of my adult life came true. And we were all together. Nobody was missing. Nobody was seriously hurt. We had nothing. Everything what we owned was in our bags and our, in our hands. But we were free. For the first time in our lives, we were free. And our spirits were just floating on the clouds. Well, I'm going to finish it up a little bit faster. I don't want to go too much. Uh, I can talk for another two hours, actually. <laughs> <laughs> two days later, we, made, we end up in a refugee camp. It was a really scary place. Uh, there were people from all corners of the world. Nash, different nationalities, different custom, different languages, mostly single men, really scary place, full of the garbage, broken alcohol bottles, but we have to go through it, there was no other choice. When we were in refugee camp, we applied for the United States of America. We have to write, write, fill out the application and write our life history. It was translated and sent over to US Council in Vienna. US Council called us for interview. It lasted about 45 minutes with translator because of course, we didn't speak English also. And council decided that we are okay to come to the United States. He approved our paperwork. They sent us to doctor. And then we couldn't leave unless we have the sponsor. We went through a refugee camp in two and a half months, which was according to people there, all time record. There were people there for two years. When we arrived, there were people who committed suicide in that refugee camp. There were people who were applying for the country they wanna go and they were getting denied over and over again. So some people every morning they woke up. This is the hope that today is the day I'm gonna be able to go. And every night that hope died. 
We were free, but we were living in the between. You, you left your old life, and none of us could go back home. And those who couldn't move on, it was really hard. Every night that hope died, so they didn't make it. We were sponsored by First Lutheran Church in Beach, North Dakota. We arrived at the beach. This was the picture for local local newspaper on the church's steps. We happened to this picture happened to be on September 11. We arrived at beach on September 8. This was three days in America. This is where we started our new life. This is how we look like. This is how those little little of those kids were. Our first steps in the better future. We made it. There was many of those who didn't. Nobody will ever find out how many people died trying to cross those borders. According to our government, the socialism was the best system there is. People are supposed to be breaking fences to get in, <clears throat> not dying to leave. So they purposely didn't keep the documentation. They didn't keep the track of it because it was bad propaganda for them. Nobody will ever find out how many people died. When we came to America, we have political asylum, we have green cards, we have social security numbers. We could start working right away next day. We did this for freedom. Freedom is a very important thing for us because we were not free. We were not born in this country. We risk everything we had, including our own lives to be free in America, to have your life. We left everybody we left behind to be free. We left everything we work for to be free, to be able uh, to, be able to look at the American flag and say, this is our flag. Until then, we knew how American flag looked like. It was my dream. I saw it during the Olympic Games or different competitions, you see all the kinds of the flags hanging around. The American flag is always the most beautiful one. It looks so much nicer than any other flag. It always stands out. And until then it was the American flag. But then it became our flag. And my wife and I, still today, 30 years later, when we are at some sports event or somewhere, and they playing the Star Spangled Banner. My wife and I cry. Because we can tell, we can say they playing our flag, our anthem now. And they raising our flag. When we arrive to beach, we have nothing. We have six hundred dollars in our pockets, clothes on our bags, little children, and we didn't speak English. And I start asking for the work right away. Because I want to go to work, I'm thinking if I sit home with my family, I'm not going to learn English. And if I don't learn English, I cannot get better opportunity. So I'm asking everybody for work. Of course, this was the 1983. That was after Jimmy Carter left the office and Reagan, uh, uh, died. President Reagan was the, in his first term. North Dakota has nothing. It is just the, just the farming industry and oil. And during the Carter administration, we know what happened to oil. It was pretty much shut down. That was the times when people were standing, waiting in lines at the gas station to get oil, to get gas. So there was unemployment. People were telling me, there is no work, but don't worry about that. We take care of it. No, I cannot do that. I have to do something. I cannot sit on my butt. So I was looking for work. I was asking everybody for work. I have a real dictionary. I am pointing at the word work, work, work. <laughs> on September 15, I start working for the first time. Eight days, seven days after we arrived in America. I was working for a local pig farmer. $3.35 an hour, that was minimum wage at the time. I work uh, nine hours a day, six days a week, just to make enough money so I can support the family. But I was looking for a better job. And three months later, I found a better job. My next job was for 450. I gave my two weeks notice and I start a better job. But I was looking for a better job. And any time I find a better job, I give my two weeks notice and start working better job. My wife and I were never unemployed. We never collected food stamps or any government handouts. We did it all ourselves. We didn't even know those handouts, handouts exist, of course, at that time. But we are the living proof that American dream is still American dream. The sky is the limit over here. It's up to you where you get. The government doesn't stop you. Our government let us go only so far and that says, they says that's it. 
you can't go any higher. I own my own company now. We own house. Our children are grown up. We have grandchildren in America. We are living proof that American dream is still alive. You just need to understand that they go behind it. You know, we did this for freedom. Freedom is very special and precious thing. It's easy to think, hey, it was like this when I was born, it's gonna be like this forever. That's not true. Freedom can, freedom can disappear really fast. We sighed around the world. We sighed in neighborhood Cuba with Fidel Castro coming to power. In about one month, the Cuba went pretty much from, they were pretty much like one of the American territory states. In one month, people lost the freedom and they are still not free. 50 some years later, we saw it in Chile, Venezuela and other countries. We saw it in Eastern Europe. There wasn't Western and Eastern Europe. There was one Europe prior to end of the World War II. And then half of the Europe became communist under socialism. And they were not free for the next 40 years. It took in my home country, I wasn't born yet. It took one week, one week when the country went from just like America, America, capitalism, free enterprise, private ownership. In one week, it was all gone. And we have total government control. People have all the businesses, houses, apartment buildings, uh, land, everything what people own was confiscated. All the weapons were made out loud. The communist leveled the field with the one single move. They devaluated the money. What's happening to us over here? The dollar is losing the value. They devaluated the money. And you know what happened? At the one time, they says, okay, the money is no good. We cannot, you're gonna print a new currency. Tomorrow, starting tomorrow, there is gonna be new money printed. And you know what they did? That leveled the field. Because people who did have money, successful people, people who own the factories and the land, farmers or anybody. Some people might have money in the coffee can under the, underneath the floor. Some people might have them in the bank. At one time, one move, and that money was no worst. It was worth nothing. You can take thousands of the crowns and walk in the store and you couldn't buy nothing. It was like you bring the toilet paper. And everybody in the whole nation started with the first paycheck. Rich, poor, anybody. First paycheck. And that's how they make everybody equal, and that's how they level, eliminate all the rich people or successful people. It's one move. And they lay the field. First they set up the SARS in the different government position. And then when they says now, those SARS arrested other government officials on the pretend accusations of whatever, collaborating with Nazis during the World War II or whatever. Those people have to exu exp uh, explain that they are not, they are not traitors or whatever they were accused for. But in the meantime, they disappear. Everything what's happening to us right now, over here in America, it's like he's taking the perfect example of how the communists came to the power in my country. We left we left that. We left that blank, dark clouds which was always hanging out over our heads. And we came to America. The shining city on the hill like Ronald Reagan named it. But that black cloud is coming this way. That black cloud is coming over here, is following us. We here talking about socialism all the time. People talk about socialism, it might be a good thing. Why could anybody think that? We saw it in Europe. There was socialism and communism for 40 years across the half of the Europe, in Russia for 70 years. And they all got away from it, including Russia, because it doesn't work, because it bankrupt the countries. Yes, Ronald Reagan had a really big role in it. But the biggest reason was that countries became totally bankrupt. Government became bankrupt, they had no money. Ronald Reagan speed it up by a few years, but it would happen anyway. We saw it in Germany. Prior to the end of the World War II, there wasn't West and East Germany. There was one Germany. And the World War II ended and it was split in the half. And they says, okay, this is gonna be, this is gonna stay capitalist. 
and free time, free enterprise, and this is gonna go socialistic. And 40 years later, they start they started at the same place. It was one country, and it was under the under, after the World War II, the country was destroyed. Their money was worth nothing. They have no industry. The factories, cities, everything was destroyed and damaged. There was nothing left. They all started at very bottom. And 40 years later, the West Germany is over here and East Germany, East Germany was over here. We have the living proof that socialism doesn't work. And it didn't happen 100, 500 years ago. It happened in this century. In our lifetimes. You can see it. Why would anybody think that socialism is good? Why wouldn't people look at that? It's not theory. It happened. You know, it's easy for somebody to say, yeah, I know, you know, yeah, you, I know what you think, but you know, that's your ideas, I think different way, you know, so whatever, you know. No, it's not anybody's ideas, it happened, we all saw it. You know, I was only thinking why, how America became the America. How come America, youngest country in the whole world pretty much, when the first immigrants came over here, or first Europeans came over here, it was 300 some years ago, and there was nothing in America. It was open land. Yes, there were natives over here, but there were no houses. There were no cities. There were no hospitals. There were no streets. There were no stores to buy the food or tools. They came over here with nothing. Everything what they have was in their hands, and they built. They have to provide the food for them and for their families, build their houses, start farming, start living their life. While around the world, there were giant, giant societies, empires, which disappeared, you know, from, from Greek to Roman to Persian to Egyptians to Ottoman. There were many, many huge empires which disappeared for hundreds and thousands of years. And America is 300 years old. And in 300 years old, the America became the superpower. People have living, highest living standard. Most of the inventions were found over here in America, from the telegraph, telephone, electricity, combustion engines, flying machine. Most of the biggest inventions happened over here in America. How come it didn't happen somewhere in Europe or Middle East or Orient? They existed for hundreds and thousands of years. Everything was same. People were living same life over there. People are using horses or walking for travel. People are using the candles to heat the, to, for the light, and they were using the, the fires to heat their houses. They, they were able to build the giant structure, you know, the Colosseum, the cathedrals, churches, huge castles. We know they were able to build it, but it never evolved. It was the same over there for thousands and thousands of years. It never worked anywhere else. All that evolution happened in America. How? Why? Why it happened over here? Why not there? They already have the base. They already have the road systems. They already even can bring, Romans could bring the water into the cities. They already have that system. But America became first and highest and best. And why? I was questioning this myself. And there is one simple conclusion. Because there was no government. When first pilgrims came over here, people are left to do what they do best. Succeed build, create. There was no government limiting them. There were no Caesars and kings and different leaders. A Pope who was limiting people in America. That's why this became what it is. And then eventually came to the point that America needed to have government. And our founding fathers came in the picture. And they knew very well how dangerous the government are. They knew how bad the government can be. They experienced it. They ran away from that. So they, write the they wrote the United States Constitution. Why? To protect us. From who? From government. That Constitution is not written to protect the government from people. It's us to be protected from the government. That's the most wonderful documents there is. But the document is being ignored and changed and destroyed. And every day we're losing freedoms. America is the greatest country there is, don't take me wrong. There is space for improvement, we all know it very well. But it is so far ahead whatever is second out there. And if we ever lose freedom over here, we have no place to go. We cannot leave America to be free somewhere else because there isn't somewhere else. America is the last island where we still enjoying as many freedoms as we have. 
But we need to be aware of it and we need to protect that. Constitution is ours. People. Founding fathers wrote the Constitution for us, not for the government, not for Washington DC, not for presidents, not for senators. They wrote it for us. It's ours, it's not theirs. It's not theirs. It's not theirs to ignore it. It's not theirs to, not theirs to massage it, change it, do whatever they want with it. It's not there, it's ours. We need to send them the message. Hands off of our Constitution, it's not yours. We need to do lots of changes and we all see what's happening. The America is going in the big spiral. We were talking about getting on this bandwagon in 1950s or 50 years ago. We all see it, it's coming down, it's coming to the, it's, it's disappearing, it's being taken away from us. We have to go and we have to make the change. We have to educate us and others. That's our only chance. That's our only chance. America is the greatest country there is. God bless America. God bless. God bless the Tea Party. And God bless the United States Constitution. Thank you. Thank you. I will just uh, quickly say one more thing. Uh, our son, our children are pretty much grown up, of course. It happened 30 years ago. Our daughter's married. She lives in Taylor's Falls. She has six children of her own. Our son joined the United States Marines after the World War, after he finished high school. And he was mobilized one week, one month before the war started. They were camped in the deserts of Kuwait, one mile from the Iraqi border. And when the order came to march in the Baghdad, he marched. He was on the very tip of Marie Column. We were scared, my wife, of course, we have child in the war, anything can happen. We were glued to the TV all the time, but we were so proud of him. Because by him serving this wonderful country of us, it's like he brought a full circle of our story. Make it a full circle. He somehow make it more meaningful. For 20 some years, people are telling me to write a book. For 20 some years, I was saying, sure, sure, I'm gonna write a book when I don't even speak proper English, you know. And then Debbie Stewart, who is my assistant and editor over here with me, she says, I can help you with it. We have the book, if anybody's interested, the book has 300 pages. The part of the story which I tell you cover, believe it or not, about 12 to 14 pages. And I still have lots of details out. So there is a lot more in the book. And uh, anybody has any questions? Hello? 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 You turn away now. We'll take... Uh, Two quick questions here, because I know it's getting uh, past nine o'clock. Check that mic and see if it's turned up. Yep. Okay. We get sound. <laughs> yes. Craig, come up to the mic here. Quick question. Though. So, Peter, thanks. Thanks very much for your your speech and your heroic act to your family. Um, and, and I agree that we are approaching a totalitarian state in, in America. But what would you be watching for where it is lost? You know, what in, in encroachment on certain freedoms would, would you view it that it's all lost now? Well, I think, uh, I think believe it or not, uh, you know, we talk about freedom of speech, and I think that freedom of speech is pretty much limited a lot right now. Because you have freedom of speech as far as you're talking uh, left. Mm -hmm. If you're talking right or conservative, your freedom of speech is getting limited. You're getting frowned upon, you're being uh, you're ridiculed, and so on. So I think, but I don't know if there is any particular thing. I think it's just the whole situation <coughs> which is happening. You know, I, I don't know. We're just, we just losing the freedoms really fast. One more. I'll be right to you. Have you noticed uh, you had to study our history that uh, we've gone downhill since uh, Teddy Roosevelt and uh, Woodrow Wilson came in in the 20s, the first, first uh, two decades of this century and ruined it. There was never a, a 
lobbyist in Congress until Wilson, he was even against them until he started getting money. This isn't too bad, he said. Now, now we've got money that is not money. Nothing's backed by gold. Who did that? Is that the, is that the question? Yeah. Well, the Federal, Federal Reserve, obviously, the, is, the, is the big, big corporate. And then Federal Reserve is the thing which should not exist. We should get rid of it. Uh, Federal Reserve is the thing, in my opinion, of course, which is choking this nation. Right. This is choking this country. They are choking us to death because they are enslaving us by our debts. You know, if, if I, if you do the business for me, and uh, I hire you to do some business, no, you, you do something and I owe you the money, and then you have to pay me. And you have to pay me with huge interest, which I'm gonna make the, I am gonna set up the interest everything else. Then you're gonna be slave to me. Because all what you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be working your life to feed your family and pay me for the rest of the life. And that's what's happening. That's what Federal Reserve does to us, does to our, this nation. That's my opinion. All right. <laughs> that's Kurt. my opinion too, Peter. <laughs> Thank you very much. Give me a round of applause. <laughs> Peter, are you gonna stick around a little bit longer? So we got a final question. Um, Don't forget, uh, Kurt, turn it up. <laughs> All righty. Make sure you get the book. He's here. Get him to autograph it. Take this story, put it in your heart. And when you talk to candidates, make them understand how important liberty is. All righty. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Yep.